ha added a bit more topics and got rid of some of the topics that I think you might already know. So it might be a bit different from last time. So yeah. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is graph traversal. So I assume you guys all know DFS and BFS, so I don't need to go through this too quickly. But essentially, DFS and BFS are ways to traverse through the graph. Uh, DFS uses recursion and BFS uses a queue. And basically, we can use this to traverse through a graph and figure out certain properties of the graph by finding connected components, finding the shortest path, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very useful for a lot of silver problems. Um, uh, yeah. And DFS is basically you first visit the node, you mark the node as visited, find whatever you want to at the node. And then after that, you go to, you basically visit all the possible new nodes. And then when you do that, you basically recursively call your function. So you recursively visit every node that we've not visited before. And that basically makes sure that we can uh, go through the entire graph. And this can find a lot of really cool things. Um, BFS, it's similar except using a queue. So instead of recursively visiting, you're basically just pushing it to the end of the queue. So um, yeah, I'll go through all of this really, really quickly because I already I think you guys already understand most of this. So, yeah. So flood fill is an algorithm based around DFS or BFS. It doesn't really matter which one you use. You just need to use one of them. So essentially, it finds the number of connected components of a graph. And the way it does that is by just iterating through every single node. And as long as that node hasn't been visited so far, you just visit it with your DFS or your BFS, and you figure out the properties of all of the connected components. And um, the most common uses of this are not actually on a graph. Usually, it's on a grid. And basically, it requires you to visualize a grid as a graph. So for example, if you're given a grid, if you're given a grid and you wanted to find like, I don't know, for each connected component, find the perimeter or something like that, which is basically the use code problem. That's the sample problem. Um, you can do that pretty easily using flood fill because um, you can just iterate through all of the possible nodes. And then after that, you can, uh, you can basically find the property. So the perimeter, basically, you just add the number of empty nodes that it connects to and something like that. So uh, usually I would have done this, but uh, we've done this last time. So um, yeah, you can look at the Yusuko problem later, but essentially the idea is to figure out the area and perimeter. Area is the size of the connected component and the perimeter is basically, um, so at each node, at each node, let's say you have a grid like this. And then this one is filled in. And this one is filled in. So the total perimeter that each of these contributes, the total perimeter that this contributes is equal to the number of empty nodes next to it. So it's equal to this plus this plus this. So that's three. So this node contributes three and this node contributes three. So that's the way you find the perimeter basically. Um, yeah. It's not really that much to say. This should all be pretty straightforward for something like this. So now let's get into some of the newer topics. So there are many other useful graph algorithms. And what is happening? OK. And essentially, there are two that potentially can show up in silver, but mostly they're gold level algorithms. So the first one is Dijkstra's. So think of a graph that's weighted, like something like this. Oh, let's do this. Okay, think of a graph like this that's weighted. So each node, uh, each edge has a weight. Like 
I don't know, just like this example, right? And you want to find the shortest path between two nodes. But like, let's say you have a node here and a node here, and you want to find the shortest path. Using BFS wouldn't be very good because they're weighted. Uh, you don't have the property that if you add it to the end, it's going to be the largest because it's weighted. You could have like something really bad happen where you add it to the end, but it's actually better than some of the previous things that you consider. And then using a queue, it's not very efficient and it becomes a really big mess. So instead of using a queue, we use something called the priority queue. So using a priority queue, it basically can find the minimum or maximum element and move that to the front. You don't care about how the elements are ordered within the priority queue, as long as the minimum element is pulled to the front. And so when we do this, we can use a similar uh, thing to BFS, except using a priority queue. And essentially we'll store the weight. So the weight of that node and the node itself. And if we store a pair like this, then it'll sort by the weight. And so it'll give you the minimum weight, which is basically the minimum distance. And then we can use that to find the uh, shortest path. So it's essentially a cool trick that allows you to um, use a priority queue instead of a queue to uh, find the shortest path in a weighted graph. And um, you can basically see this everywhere and it's called Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, the other important one in silver that potentially can show up is let's say you're dealing with a graph. I'll keep this one a bit more simple. Again, it can be weighted, it can be not weighted. It doesn't really matter. Uh, three, five. Okay, let's say these are your side length or your edge weights and um, if you want to find the shortest path between all pairs of nodes, what you can do instead is to basically do this following algorithm, where basically you uh, iterate through all of the middle nodes. So let's say you iterate through all of the middle nodes. Let's call them K. So that's your first for loop for K. And then for your next two for loops, you do for I and for J. And these are basically your starting and ending nodes. You basically now want to update it. So essentially, um, you can go from I to K and then K to J, and that's a possible path. But if your current shortest path is greater than that, you want to just update your shortest path to be from I to K, K to J. And so to do that, we can use this equation. Uh, we can use this equation to do that. So we can say if SP I J greater than SP I K plus SP K J if this, then you set it this equals to this. So you set this equals to this. And then if you keep doing this over all possible middle points, it's actually uh, not that tough to prove that this relaxation will eventually be able to figure out the, like, the correct answer for every pair. And so once you've done this in O of n cubed, um, you can do something else and find the answer or whatever. Um, yeah, so this is basically the idea. Um, yeah, are there any questions about this? Uh, okay, if not, then we'll move on to the other thing that we'll talk about, which is binary search and other sorting techniques. And in this case, sorting techniques doesn't mean way to sort something, but it 
it means like a way to take advantage of sorted properties and um, basically use that to our advantage to solve a problem. So what is binary search? Well, I think we all know this already. So yeah, the new part about this slide is ternary search, which you don't need to know, but if your array looks something like this, you can use ternary search. You basically find one in each third, then um, you can figure out which third the peak is in. So if they're equal, if they're equal, then you know the, uh, then you know it's in the middle third. If they're, if one of them is greater than the other, so let's say you have a peak like this, and you had this, this, one of them is greater than the other, so you can eliminate this one, and then you have these now. And basically, you can use this to figure out um, the peak in O of log n time. But that's not really that useful. It's just a really cool thing that you can do. So yeah. Um, there are many applications of binary search. And uh, the first most obvious one is to find a certain element in a sorted array. And this is like this is the, by far the most common utilization of binary search, but it's also not the only one. And usually, when you use binary search to do this, you can probably um, use a custom function to do this because it's probably already coded within whatever language you're using. Um, you can binary search for the answer, and this is one of the most tricky uses of binary search that there is. Like, let's say the problem is asking you for a single number, right? And certain answers, it's really easy to tell whether an answer works or doesn't. And then, then if you can prove that the answer satisfies a uh, monotonicity, so monotonicity is a very common term that I'll use in the slides and also a very common term you'll see outside. If it satisfies monotonicity, and monotonicity is basically where it's strictly, or not strictly, but it's increasing or decreasing, increasing or decreasing. Basically, if something is monotonic, then, If something is monotonic, then you'll never find two numbers, i and j, and uh, a and b, such that i is less than j and a is less than b. You'll never find these two sets of numbers. You'll never find a of i is greater than a of j, and a of a is less than a of b. You'll never find these two things. So this is basically monotonicity. And it's not that it's not that complicated. You can just think about it as like, like always increasing or always decreasing. And that usually will be able to um, suffice. Like, yeah. So in this case, we want to prove that whether the answer works is monotonic. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's either all zeros and then a one and then here. And then uh, the problem likely will find the lowest one. So that would be our answer. Or it's a bunch of ones and then zeros. And in that case, usually this will be our answer. So um, in both cases, you can use binary search to just find the answer. And that's actually a very common technique that is also very, very, very like hard to think of. and if you don't think of it, you likely cannot solve the problem. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, here's a practice problem. We did do it last time, but I think it's a very uh, good problem. So, um, yeah, we can take a moment to, you know, think about it. And, yeah, we'll go over the solution after a couple of minutes. Also, don't be shy to like direct message me or anything like that. Um, 
Yeah, generally more questions is better because that means that you're actively learning rather than passively learning. And actively learning is much more effective. And also, you know, it's a bit boring if no one talks to me. Oh, um, if you wanted the link, I can send it in chat as well. Um, Oh my God, what is happening? Okay, it seems that no one has messaged me, so there aren't any ideas. Uh, so let's try to get started with a couple ideas about how to solve this problem. First, we want to think about, okay, how would we directly compute what the answer is? And like, there's no real easy way to do that. Like, you can think of many different possibilities, but not, not many of them work. Like, it's not very easy to figure out a way to directly compute how much time it'll take. So instead, what if we try to say, well, let's say if we have a time, can we compute whether it's possible? And that is actually very, very easy. So let's say the cows arrive here, 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 here. It doesn't really matter what the exact numbers are, but this is just to illustrate something, right? And you have like three wagons. So what happens is you basically place your wagon here and it'll occupy T amounts of time. So it'll occupy T amounts of time. And then within those T amounts of time, all of these cows within here are crossed out. Now you look at the next leftmost cow and that's this one. Now you do T amounts of time. So it starts from here boop, and then ends so here. And then you find the next leftmost, and then you go here, and then here. So by doing this, you can just easily figure out that you can binary search on the answer because it's obvious that as you increase the time, of course, it's going to be more and more possible. So we can do a binary search on the answer pretty easily because we know it's monotonic. And now we see that it's actually very easy to calculate what the answer 
or or whether the answer works once we have an answer. And so, yeah, we can just use binary search. Um, yeah. Are there any questions about that? Okay, if there aren't any questions about that, then we can move on to the next slide. So other sorting techniques. Um, so basically it's not really how you sort something because how you sort something isn't very important most of the time. The most important thing is that they're sorted. So now let's think about how to take advantage of the sorted properties. And there are a few ways to do that. Um, the first one is greedy algorithms. And so you can take advantage of something that's sorted by uh, saying, oh, well, we can just take the first one instead of, oh, which one do we take? So um, we can use greedy algorithms. We can do coordinate compression with this, and we can also do two pointers. Two pointers is probably one of the harder topics that silver covers, but it's also not appearing that much recently. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, yikes. So, in a greedy algorithm, the idea is that there's a value function that you want to maximize, and to maximize that value function, you just take the object that has the biggest value first, and then you keep doing that until you're done, and that sometimes works and sometimes it also doesn't work. And um, what we want to do is we want to use sorting to make it so that it's much easier to do that. So um, first, we need to prove that in order for this to work, you need to uh, basically prove that taking one value doesn't change the orderings of the other values. What does that mean? Well, let's say that you take one value, um, Let's say you take one value, like let's say your values are five, two, one. But then if you take the five, your two becomes negative 10 and your one becomes 10. Like if this happens, then you can't just keep taking those, right? And like instead, if you take like two, like, and then, and then like something happens, like, Basically, you need to make sure that your greed, your like value function doesn't change erratically once you, you've already taken something. Um, and uh, another thing that you need to do is, this should be the very, very first thing you do on many, many problems. Like many problems will be maximize value A or maximize whatever. Whenever you have a maximize or like an optimality problem, you always start by thinking about greedy. And depending on whether greedy works, like it always leads you towards um, progress. And what do I mean by this? Well, if greedy works, then like once you prove that it works, then you can just code it and, and submit it. And yeah, right, you're done with the problem. But if greedy doesn't work, then you can often figure out, well, why doesn't greedy work? What is preventing greedy from working? And once you figure it out, oh, what is preventing greedy from working? How do you work around that? Do you use, I don't know, like brute force on a little part of it that can basically get around that little hump? Or what do you do, right? You can often figure out like um, through greedy, like that you need a particular algorithm to solve that problem. And so you should always try to think of greedy first before you do anything else. Um, yeah, so here's a practice problem to practice greedy, but uh, yeah, I'll give you a few minutes to solve this or to try this as well. Um, I will try to uh, send the link. Um, 
just remember that in order for you to actually fully understand greedy, you also need to prove that it works. And proving that it works is often the hardest part about greedy. It's not the, you know, actually coming up with the greedy solution. It's proving that it works. And um, yeah. This shouldn't be such a hard problem. If you want more inspiration as to like what greedy to use, um, one of the best ways to get like a grasp of what greedy algorithm you want to use is just to use examples. So for example, if you create your own test cases, and you figure out, oh, well, which configurations give you the correct answer? And then you compare all of them and you figure out, oh, well, a certain pattern always works. Then after you figured out what pattern it is, you want to prove that pattern is the pattern that you want to use. Again, don't be afraid to um, ask me questions if you're stuck or, you know, like tell me ideas or anything like that. Um, yeah, that is correct. So uh, Manning basically has the correct solution. Um, what you wanna do is you basically sort it in decreasing order and once you've sorted it in decreasing order, um, you can basically figure out uh, whether the cow works. And then once the cow doesn't work, then you can just output the answer. Um, uh, what happened? So um, there's quite a few ways to prove this. Um, I'll just outline one of the most intuitive ones. So let's say you have, um, so it's obvious that the first few will work and the next few will not work. And so let's say that we have something like, it's decreasing mostly, but there are two things over somewhere that are increasing. If it's increasing within this, it literally does not change the answer. And so that means it'll have to be increasing over here. So let's say this A is the end here and B is the end here and B is greater than A. Then what happens when we swap B and A? Well, we know that A already doesn't work, right? And so B or, yeah. And so if you swap them, then, or I mean, A already works. So if you swap them, B definitely already works. So that means that this will have a better chance of not working or uh, that I could have phrased that better, but essentially you'll only be able to decrease your score. And if you do this again, like let's say over here, so the only ways that it can be possible are over here. And you can quickly work that swapping them is always going to be uh, better than not swapping them. So it, eventually what will happen is uh, there will be no pairs such that A is greater than B, or, a is less than B because if there is one, we swap it and we get a better answer. And from that argument, we can prove that it's always decreasing. Um, another way you can do this, it's not as formal, but it still works. Like Yusuko is not gonna check your proof. Um, you can just say, oh, well, uh, let's try some, one, two, three. Well, what is the best way to do this? Oh, it's three, two, one. And then, okay, four, one, two, what's the best way to do this? Four, two, one. And then after that, you can figure out that roughly that, oh, it should always be decreasing. And sometimes you can do that. Sometimes that'll just lead you astray. But generally you want to notice a pattern and then prove the pattern. If you can't prove it, then try to find why can't you prove it? And 
once you figure out why can't you prove it, um, then you can work around that with a different algorithm to try to basically get around it and uh, get the correct answer. So, yeah. So the next thing that involves sorting is coordinate compression. Coordinate compression is a very complicated, uh, or not very complicated. It's basically uh, where you have a bunch of coordinates and let's say they're in a 2D grid and your coordinates are really, really, really large. Like they're massive, massive coordinates. And um, you don't like massive coordinates because that means it might be harder to deal with, with like some sort of whatever algorithm you use. It might be very hard to deal with really large coordinates. So what we do is we compress the coordinates. Let's say the coordinates themselves don't really matter. What we really care about is the order that the coordinates are in. So how do we compress the coordinates so that it fills in an n by n grid? And we can easily do that by using coordinate compression. So the idea is to basically, let's say, uh, or yeah, let's say again, you have a 2D grid. Right. And now we sort like all of the X coordinates. So we sort all of the X coordinates and then we have like one, 1000 dot, 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 whatever. And then after that, we assign one to be one, a thousand to be two, the next one to be three and then so on and so forth. And then after that, we go over to these coordinates. Right. And then we say, oh, well, this one, your X coordinate becomes one. It's not whatever this is, it's one. This one, your X coordinate is two. This one, your X coordinate is three. This one, your X coordinate is four. And this one, like, you know, so on and so forth. And if they're the same, then um, this one, like for example, this one will also have X coordinate four because it's the same. But essentially it'll, reduce the coordinates down to really, really small sizes that are very, very manageable. And it'll make some previously impossible algorithms like prefix sums or whatever to be suddenly possible. And uh, once that happens, then a whole new world of possibilities, you know, begin. Um, so the most, the most common way this is done is to sort the coordinates first, then, oh, okay, well, it went through it by itself, but then you um, each assign each coordinate with an increasing value. And then basically after that, you reassign those original coordinates with the new coordinates, which are much, much more manageable. So the way we do this is we put every value into a set, then iterate through the set to assign values to indices. And then going back, uh, and then going like basically assigning the values to the indices, like uh, using a map or whatever, right? And so after that, we go back to all of the original coordinates and we assign them the new coordinates using the map. Um, so it doesn't explicitly, what is happening? What is happening? Uh, okay, I have no clue why it's happening with my mouse, but um, okay, so yeah, so basically by using a set and a map, it doesn't explicitly sort anything, but when you put everything into a set, the set automatically sorts everything. So it doesn't really matter like that you're not explicitly sorting it because you're sorting it anyways through the set and the map. And usually this is good enough to basically compress all of your coordinates and do whatever with that. Um, yeah. Um, this isn't actually used that much in silver. Like I remember one or two problems that have ever used it, but it's also a very, very, very important technique that you need to know 
for, uh, especially when you go into more advanced levels, this should be something that is like a side algorithm. It should be something that uh, you don't have to, like, it's kind of like if you're in silver and part of the problem is simulating something, but the real, like, part of the first part of the problem is to simulate something but really the hard part is to do like two pointers or whatever you don't think about the simulation part you think about the two pointers and how that's going to work this should be something similar to that where you don't like you think about oh it might be a binary index tree or whatever but i need to compress the coordinates first you don't need to think about like oh i need to compress the coordinates you just you can do it so it's something that is very very important especially once you get into gold and platinum and you know yeah okay so the next thing that we'll talk about is two pointers so let's say you want to find the optimal range within an array such that it satisfies some sort of condition um like for example let's say you want to find like the maximum possible the maximum possible range such that the sum of all of the elements like the maximum possible product like maximum possible product like this is just a really weird example but product such that the sum such that sum doesn't exceed a certain number so if we have something like this, so if we have something like this, where we need to find the maximum possible product and, um, and we need it so that the sum doesn't exceed a certain number, what we can realize is, well, if we increase this, like if we add this next number, E is going to make this less likely and this bigger. That's basically the idea. We're having two conditions such that as long as we increase it, it makes it less likely to be the case, but it also makes our answer larger. And um, these types of problems are very common within competitive programming. And the way you solve these is using two pointers. So essentially, we keep two pointers. Uh, we keep two pointers within the array, and like if we think of this as a sliding window, uh, that's another name for it. So two pointers or sliding window. Um, if you think of this as a sliding window, as long as your condition still is satisfied, then you keep increasing it all the way to the maximum. But as soon as the next one doesn't work, you can't keep increasing it, or else it'll just not work. So you increase the left pointer in such a way that like you increase the left pointer and then, okay, now it might work like when you increase it, but if it still doesn't work, then you increase the left pointer. And so you increase the right pointer until you kind of like hit a wall kind of, and then you increase the left pointer and then you just keep sliding your window down until you find the maximum possible um, answer. So, yeah, this is guaranteed to work if both conditions are monotonic. Again, monotonicity is very important where um, if your condition, like for example, if this, if you have negative numbers, is will not work. This will definitely not work because like in this example, first of all, if you have negative numbers, the sum will fluctuate uh, and if you increase it, it'll not necessarily make it so that the sum doesn't exceed, like, if you increase the size of the range, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sum will increase, which basically means that sometimes you'll have, like, one array or one subsegment like this. Oh. Uh, you'll have one subsegment like this. And then let's say you increase it and this is a negative number, negative one or something like that. Like this is a negative number and suddenly your sum goes down 
And let's say originally this number is k. Let's say originally the sum over here was k plus one. So this would not work, but this would work because the sum is k. And that means that it's not monotonic. And that means that it won't work if there are negative numbers. But if both conditions are monotonic, it's very easy to see that this will always work. And one very important note about this is that although it may look like the time complexity is very big, we have two pointers. We need to iterate through everything with two pointers. It should be n squared, right? No, in fact, it's actually O of n because if you consider, if you consider um, like each time, like the sum of L plus R, L is the left pointer, R is the right pointer. If you consider the sum every time, if we can increase R, we do that. Otherwise we increase L. That means every time we're increasing L plus R always increases by one, increases by one. So if we look at the original, originally L plus R is zero. At the end, it's 2n. So the total number of operations we're actually increasing it by is 2n. So we're actually only doing O of n operations, which this is essentially the reason two pointers is so powerful. It's that instead of needing to brute force through all of the possible ranges, instead we can use a sliding window and decrease our time complexity down to O of n. Um, yeah. And so, I even have a practice problem about this over here. Okay. Uh, give you a couple of seconds to, or a couple of minutes to think about this. And then um, we'll go over the solution. Uh, yeah. I have no clue what is going on with my mouse right now. It's just randomly going places. Again, don't be shy to uh, put your ideas in the chat, whether it's to directly to me or whether it's to everyone, because um, trying to actively solve problems is something that it's basically the only way to improve. You can learn algorithms all you want, but you're never going to really get something unless you, um, unless you try to solve the problems yourself. So, yeah, putting uh, ideas in the chat um, is something that will help you 
a lot more than just listening to me. We are running a bit short on time. I think I'm supposed to finish this in one hour, but I'll give you a couple more minutes to think about this. It's a pretty neat problem. It's something that you can draw inspiration from when you're trying to solve other problems. Okay, so um, do you guys have any ideas about how to solve this problem? Or do you guys just want me to just go over the problem? It's a pretty nice problem to solve yourself, so. If no one responds, then I guess I'll... Uh, uh, so when you're uh, thinking of ideas, you want to basically visualize how uh, your code would work. So sure, make an array, sort it. Then after that, what is the next step? Like use K as a check is not really something concrete that you're going to be able to um, design your code around. So um, you want to think about something a bit more concrete. So Yes, make an array, sort it. Then after you do that, what do you observe about all the possible good arrangements? So for example, let's say we make an array, we make an array, right, of all of the things. Let's say it's like four, seven, 10, 11, 12, 19, right? Okay, we've sorted it. Now what? What do we notice about, let's say k is k equals five. What do we notice about all of the potentially valid arrangements? compare it to each other with K as a boundary. So, so what do you mean by compare it to each other with K as a boundary? Like we can have, like, an arrangement is a bunch of different things. So let's say that we want to take seven. Now we can not take 19 because K equals five, right? We can't take 19, right? But what can we take? We can take all of these and this, right? And because we can take all of these, 
Yeah. And now let's say, let's say we take 10. Now what can we take? We can't take four anymore, right? So we can only take 11 and 12, and then we take 11 and 12. And then, okay, let's construct another potentially valid arrangement. We add until we can't add anymore, right? Let's say we take four, okay? Then we can only take seven. Now we can't take any more, so it's here. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So are you trying to, yeah, so, oh, yeah, I think you've already gotten this, but you haven't like explicitly stated this, but what I wanted you to guys to notice is that um, all of this is in a range, right? All of the potentially possible arrangements are a range of different things. And if you think about it, that's very, very obvious. Once you take, once you determine which ends that you take, um, you can take everything within the middle and not affect how the answer is. So um, it's always a range. Now we think, oh, it's a range. We want to use two pointers, right? So uh, I think this is creating the echo. So <clears throat> we created, we found that it has to be a range. So, so now we need to prove the monotonicity of the condition. Is it always true that expanding it will increase K or will increase the difference, which, wait, not, wait why not? Because we're expanding it. This has to be greater, right? Because we've already sorted it. So why wouldn't it expand? the sum, right? Yeah, so it's monotonic, right? The condition is monotonic. Now, what about the thing that we're trying to optimize? Well, if we increase the number of, or if we increase the right endpoint, are we necessarily increasing the number of diamonds that we're taking? Of course, right? So now that we've established both conditions are monotonic, we've also established that our answer is a range. Well, of course, we can just use two pointers. So we keep a left pointer indicating the left endpoint of our range, the right pointer indicating the right endpoint of our range, and we can just run a two pointers and then that would solve the problem. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, here is that written up. And, um, yeah. So now I kind of want to close on some, not really some algorithms, but just some strategies to just try to increase your score on the actual competition. So, what is happening? So these strategies are usually about like figuring out what your code should look like based on the constraints, based on the subtasks, whatever, right? So in a normal use of code contest, um, each problem has something like, it in the problem statement, it says something like N, is less than or equal to 10 to the five, something like that. Let's say it does say that, but then at the bottom, you'll also notice that it says subtasks, something like that. And then after that, it'll say test cases, cases two through, I don't know, eight satisfy something and then it'll have more things that look like this until it says uh test cases like i don't know 11 to 19 satisfy no additional constraints and using this 
we can actually devise like what our code should look like. So for example, let's say you see in the problem that n is less than or equal to 20. Now, once you see n is less than or equal to 20, you immediately realize, oh, hey, this means I should probably use something that's n times two to the n or n squared times two to the n. And so now you would stop looking for a solution that runs in linear time, runs in quadratic time, something like that, because those solutions would not be like, first of all, would likely not be possible. And if it were possible, it would likely be beyond the scope of silver. So at, once you see n equals 20, it, something should click that, oh, maybe I need to brute force. And maybe I need to simulate. Maybe I need to use bit masks in some way. Maybe I need to, you know, do something like that. And once you figure that out, it becomes much easier to say, hey, I know n is less than or equal to 20. I don't need to search for any of those polynomial time solutions. So now let's see how I can use these bit masks, these various ideas about bit masks to solve the problem. Again, a similar idea with like all of these types of things. If you see n equals to this very specific number, then you are almost certain of your time complexity. And once you have this really, really obscure time complexity that you know, now you're thinking about how can I get that time complexity and how those potential algorithms can help me solve these problems. And this is a very, very um, useful kind of uh, observation, I guess, that you can have where you realize from the constraints that, oh, these are the time complexities that I'm looking for. And that means that I cannot like, for example, if n is this, right, you're not going to be able to get an n squared solution to pass. You're going to be trying to optimize that. So you can basically narrow your search space of oh, what you're searching for into something that is much, much smaller. And this can apply to a lot of different values of n outside of the ones within this, you know, little table. For example, one of the most common ways to uh, utilize this obscure, or not obscure, but like weird time complexity trick is uh, if n is 40. And I believe there was a February problem this year that had something to do with this, um, where basically they gave you n equals 40. And um, like, if you knew meet in the middle before the contest, you probably aren't a silver contestant. Meet in the middle is far and beyond the scope of silver. But the way you would solve this kind of question is to say, oh, n is 40. What do I know about n is 40? Well, if I split 40 into two, then I get 20. And 20, well, that's in the table, right? So let's say, oh, let's say our aim complexity is n times two to the n over two. This is our target time complexity. Now, how do we achieve that? Well, let's try to create a construction where, oh, maybe originally you have n points. What if we instead split it into two piles of n over two? And each pile, Okay, each pile, let's brute force everything within this pile. That's two to the n over two. Okay, now once we've had that, you know, each pile solved, how do we combine them? And then using this kind of thinking methodology, it's really easy to figure out, oh, hey, I can do this to solve this problem, or I can do that to solve this problem. And I think this is one of the most... Um, I think this is one of the most like subtly utilized uh, uh, tricks that people tend to figure out. So you generally, no one tells you this kind of thing. You generally, by doing enough problems, you say, oh, well, hmm, n is 40. That's familiar because I can use this type of algorithm. Hmm, n is 500. 
that means I should use n cubed or whatever, right? And using this kind of um, time complexity trick, you can really quickly sometimes figure out problems that might like, if you were trying to figure them out without the constraint, it would be very, very, very hard. So um, yeah, use the constraints within the problem to your advantage. And um, that'll often help. And even if it doesn't help you find the entire solution, um, you can look at the subtasks and you can also use those to infer some more information about the solution. You can often solve the subtasks, subtasks first. And then after that, it's just one small observation away from the next subtask or one small observation away from solving the whole problem. So this is a very useful trick that you should generally utilize if you're trying to maximize your score in the competition. Um, yeah, that's basically it for the lecture today. Um, I've compiled a giant list of practice problems that you might be interested in trying to do. Um, yeah, and the rest of the session is going to be uh, questions and answers, or if you don't have many questions, I can help you uh, through some of these um, problems, which may be actually pretty tough. Um, yeah. Any questions? I'll send all of these links in. Um, this question, uh, I assume you've already read it, so I'll just go over the solution real really quickly. So essentially, you have a tree. A tree is a special type of graph, which, so let's see, you go here. Let's say this is what your graph looks like. Of course, this is not really what the graph looks like. You have H, H, G, I don't know, G, G, H. The key observation here is to notice that in two paths, right, in order for, or in one path, let's say you go from here to here, um, it only doesn't work if, and only if every single node on the path is of the opposite um, of the opposite breed. So basically, if A goes to B uh, and H or something like that, that means every node on the path from A to B must have G in order for this to be zero. So how do we take advantage of this? Then. Uh, uh, well, how do we take advantage of this? Well, we can basically um, say that each connected component of G only G's is like one like separate connected component and that there are no edges between that connected component and other things. Because if we think of it that way, then we can say that, well, each of these are in the same component. So one, one, one. This is in a different component, two, three, four, right? And if we think about it that way, then no matter what, in two different connected components, so if A and B and breed, right, whatever thing here, H, right? So if we have A and B, if they're in the same component, then um, we can still have something happen, right? But if they're in the different components, so if A, if component of A is not equal to B, component of B, then already we know that the answer is one. Answer is one. That makes sense, right? Okay, so if they're in different components, the answer is one. Now we just need to figure out, okay, they're in the same component, so now what do we do? Well, we can basically say, if they're in the same component, we can find the breed of that component. So the breed of A, since the breed of A is equal to the breed of the component, so if breed of A equals to H, which is the this right here, right? If it's equal to H, then the answer is well, still one. But 
But if this is not true, that means that every node from A to B is G. That means that the answer is zero in that case. So um, we check if their components are the same. And if they are, the answer is one. We then check if the breed of A is equal to the breed given. And if it is, then the answer is still one. But if neither of those conditions are true, then the answer is zero. And once we do that, we can basically find the answer for all of them. And the way we basically find all of the connected components is to use flood fill. So we start with this one, and then we flood fill all the way down here, and we've figured out all of these. And then we can cross those out as visited. Now we go here, cross this out as visited. That doesn't have anything else. Go here, cross this as visited, cross this as visited. And once you do that, you've basically marked all of your connected components. That makes sense, right? So the idea is basically to split the tree into a bunch of different connected components. And then using that, you can easily figure out what the answer is. That makes sense, right? OK, that's good. Um, yeah, were there any other questions you had? Oh. Yeah, what is your question? Mm hmm In the sample, right? Okay. So let's okay, let's clear this. Let's draw the sample graph. So one goes to two, two goes to three, two goes to four, and one goes to five. Okay. And then one is H, H, G, H, G. Okay. So one goes to five. And then, then what? So, oh, okay. So we're not actually traversing anything, right? We're basically first, before we answer any of the queries, we uh, find all the connected components, right? And the connected components, so let's say um, we go here. Basically, uh, we can get rid of all of the edges that go between like we get rid of all of the edges that go between two nodes of different breeds, right? And once we do that, we can basically find all of the connected components of the graph using flood fill, right? Once we find all of the connected components, we don't care what the actual path between A and B is. We only care about whether they're in the same connected component. Does that make sense? So our program doesn't care at all about what happens, like what the edges are. But you need to know where it goes to know whether it's H or G. No, 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 no. You, you only need, to, you only care if they're in the same connected component because at the ends, if they're in different connected components, right? If they're in different connected components, think about it this way, right? You have a connected component of H here, right? And you have a connected component of H here, right? No matter what, if they're not connected, that means that it has to go through a G first before it can go to back to an H, right? And if it has to go through a G first, it doesn't matter because there's both H and G on the path, right? Yeah. Oh, you know if it goes through a G first because they're not connected. If they're not connected, that means that there is no edge between this connected component and this connected component. Um, because at, 
like or basically you know that if it went through if it didn't go through a g first right if it didn't go through a g first let's say this was an h instead that means that this would be connect this node would be part of this right but it would also be part of this so that means these would be the same component but they're different components so it has to go through a g first does that make sense No, 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 no. So not all H's are in the same component. They're in the same component. So for example, let's draw a graph like this. A really simple graph. H, G, H, G, right? Our, we would still have three connected components because these H's aren't connected at all, right? Yeah. And because they're, these H's aren't connected, like by definition, they would have to go through a G first to then go to an H, right? So if these are in different connected components, right, then we would have to go through the G first because the only edges out of the connected components are two Gs. And then after that, only then can we go back to an H, right? Yeah. And that means that no matter what, if they're in two different components, it'll contain both H and G, right? If two H's aren't. Yeah, yeah, that's basically what I'm trying to say. If two H's aren't connected, it has to go through a G. And so um, you just need to check whether they're in the same component or not. So if the milk was like H, 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 then all of the H's would be in the same component because you know that in a tree, everything is connected. So if you had something like H, 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 they're part of the same connected component. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but because it's part of the same connected component, right? It's part of the same connected component. So um, they're in the same component. So then after that, you check whether it's G or H, and then you can find the answer. So I think the issue here is that uh, I, I kind of defined connected component kind of loosely. So a connected component is if, so basically let's uh, consider the tree, except we remove all edges between, between um, nodes that are different, right? If we just removed all edges from nodes that, are different. So here there would have been an edge, but because H and G are different, then we just completely like remove the edge, right? Now we can find the connected components of this new graph. And it's pretty easy to see that each connected component has all all nodes are the same right? All nodes are the same milk. And in order to go to a different node, or in order to go to a different connected component, 
you would have to go through both types of milk in order to get there, right? Yeah, and that basically proves the uh, solution, right? Hmm. Okay. So, um, hmm. Goes from one to two to four. So, like, there's a different person. Oh, I see. So, the problem is in a tree, there are. So, this is something that uh, is like memorizable. So, in a tree, there are several cool properties. But one of the most important ones is that between any two nodes, there's only one path. And that's actually pretty easy to see from this tree, right? Between any two nodes, there's exactly one simple path, right? Yeah, so I think that's the Part that you were missing so it's a tree so there's only one path and because there's only one path then um yeah mm -hmm. For the first one. Oh, it doesn't just it doesn't calculate any of that. It calculates all of the connected components first, and then to solve a query, you just need to figure out whether they're in the same connected component. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um yeah, were there any more questions? Okay, yeah. Thank you too for uh, participating and you know asking questions.